All right, the part of the passage I want to focus on this morning in 2 Chronicles chapter 25 is near the beginning, starting in verse number 6. If you look down at your Bibles, this is talking about Amaziah, king of Judah, and basically they said he was a good king, but he didn't, he, you know, he followed, he, he was a good king before God, but not completely with a full heart. And one of the things that, that's happening here is that there's a battle that's going to take place, and he's gathering together all of Judah to fight, but then he goes and also hires Israel, and, and at the time, Israel's really wicked, and instead of just trusting completely in God, that God's going to be able to deliver them, you know, that, that Judah, they don't need help from, from wicked people, they don't need help from anyone else, they can just fight God's battles because they're going to serve God and, and rely and trust in God. So instead of fully trusting in him, what he decided to do is say, well, we're also going to hire some soldiers. We're going to hire some mercenaries. We're going to hire some people from Israel to, to come to the battle to fight with us, you know, to beef up our numbers, to give us a better chance of winning. Um, it's, a, you know, it's, it's that type of a mindset, which you could understand it just worldly thinking. Yeah. Right? Worldly thinking, you're going to be thinking, well... My enemy has this many troops and we have this many, so we just need to get more in order to, to win this fight. That's a completely worldly mindset, but see, when, with a, a godly mindset, it's going to be, well, if God be for us, who could be against us? God can save by many or by few. God doesn't need the numbers to be in his favor in order to bring victory You know, in any battle, whether it be a military battle or any battle that you have. You need to just, we need to learn, and that's a common theme all throughout Scripture. That's just highlighted over and over and over again, especially in these books, the books of the Kings and the Chronicles, and First and Second Samuel, and you know, all throughout Scripture. We see the same theme being taught. So Amaziah here, we're going to read this about him hiring these men from Israel. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, He hired also 100,000 mighty men of valor out of Israel for 100 talents of silver. But there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel, to wit, with all the children of Ephraim. So this prophet comes out and he ends up rebuking Amaziah and warning him and saying, Look, you hired these men of Israel, but, but don't let them go to the battle because God is not with them. And this is an important lesson in and of itself, which is not what I'm focusing on in general for the sermon. But when you start yoking up with these people, with wicked people, even if it's to fight your fight, he's saying don't just start joining forces with all these different people because if God's not with them, then God's not going to be with you because God's not with them to start bringing these people on. And that's the warning. You're saying, hey, you're yoking up with the children of Israel who at this time are really wicked. Don't do that because God is not with them and he's not going to be with them, which means the power of God's going to depart from you and then you're going to be left to yourself. Yeah, you'll have this physical arm of flesh. You'll have the help from these children of Israel. But, but that's not what you want to be trusting in. Why, why don't you, you retain the power of God upon you because you don't need these people. You don't need their help. And this is what the man of God is explaining to him. He says here in verse number 8, But if thou wilt go, do it. Be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God hath power to help and to cast down. And basically what he's saying is that not only would you, is the, the power of God could be departed from you, he said, but God can just make sure that you lose the battle. God has a power to help. Just as much as God's able to defeat your enemies, He's able to defeat you too. If you just want to rely on that extra help, that extra 100,000, 100, so that's a lot of people. Right? I mean, that's a significant addition to their armed forces. Wow, 100,000 people. How could we not have that? He's saying, you know what? If you don't use them, God can win for you. And if you do use them, God can cast you down. Like actually adding the 100,000 soldiers is going to be worse for you and, and God can make sure that you lose. So Amaziah, he doesn't reject this. He actually listens to the man. But he has this one objection and this is what I want to be focusing on for the kind of sermon this morning. Verse number 9. Bible says, And Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do for the 100 talents which I have given to the army of Israel? He's saying basically... 
I've already paid for these guys. I mean, it's a hundred talents of silver. We're heavily invested in this. That's a lot of money. I mean, what do I do about that? You're telling me not to use these guys, and I've already bought and paid for it. But still, just carnally minded, thinking about the money, thinking about that investment, and the man of God answers him. It says, and the man of God answered, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. He said, don't worry about the money. Just do what's right. And this is what I want to focus on this morning. Don't worry about how much you've invested in things that are wrong. As you live and as you grow and as you spiritually mature, you're going to find out that maybe some paths that you started to go down aren't the right path. Some things that you may have already heavily invested in aren't the right thing to do. And you can see it then. You're ignorant in times past maybe. Right? You just didn't know anybody. You're not, you're not trying to be wicked or trying to sin or trying to do any problems. But when you come to the realization, man, what I've been doing here is wrong. I actually need to change this in my life. Yeah, but what do I do? I mean, I've already invested all this money or all this time or all this resource. What we're, te- what we're being taught here is don't worry about that. Because whatever you might perceive as a loss... Right? I mean, wow, well, that's a hundred talents of till silver. I mean, we're just never going to get that back? Yeah, you're never going to get that back. Consider that a lesson learned. Yeah, that's right. And move forward on it. And don't dwell on these losses, especially these carnal losses, these physical losses, that it's just like, it's just money. God can bless you. God can abound. And God can make you poor. Don't worry. But just as much as you shouldn't be worrying about, oh, well, we need to have these extra troops, don't worry about the extra money either. Because God can provide. And God will provide, especially when you make the right choices. When you just do what's right, God will make sure that you're taken care of. When you realize that something is not the right thing to do, you just say, you know, we need to have the heart that just says, I'm going to forsake it completely. And I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to stress out about it. I'm just going to do what's right. Now, this is an exercise of faith. Because, again, like I said, by the worldly thinking, it, of course you should want to have more troops. And the same token, by the worldly thinking, why have I invested in this? Why well, don't want that to be a total waste? You need to have the faith that the Bible is right and that God is true and that when God makes a promise, that He will keep that promise. And that when God says it's better to obey than to sacrifice, let's believe that. When the man of God here in God's word says, hey, the Lord's able to give thee much more than this, let's just trust in that and believe that and understand, okay, well, God's more concerned about me just doing right than about that waste of money. And if I start doing right, God will make sure our financial needs are met anyways. So we don't have to worry about that loss, as big as it may seem. This is very similar. Turn, if you would, to Malachi chapter number 3. Just in in concept, to help grab this concept, it's very similar to tithing. A lot of people, especially when you don't have a lot of money, right? I think it's easier to tithe when you are doing well financially because that 10%... It's not, it's not as big of an impact, right? You're already pretty comfortable. Yeah, it's more money because it's a percentage, but it's still, you know, you're, you're able to get by more. But when, when you don't have a lot of money, I think it's harder for people to make the decision to say, well, I'm just going to do this because it's right, because I don't know how I'm going to live off of 90% of my income. I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't think I'd be able to pay my bills. I don't think I'm going to be able to survive. I don't think I could do this. I have too many mouths to feed. I have, you know, I'm not making enough money or whatever the case may be. I can't do this. There's no way I, I could do this. But God makes a promise in Malachi chapter 3 that He just wants you to be obedient. Because first of all, God doesn't need money to do anything. God's so far above that. But what God wants is the obedience. He want, he, there, there are certain aspects of our life where doing the right thing is, is a test. God wants to see, are you going to do what's right? 
And I'm not bringing this up because I want your money. It doesn't matter to me. You do what you want to do with your money. The, old, the, the extent that it matters to me is I just want everybody to be right with God. With just what the Bible teaches. That's what I care about. I'd rather not have anybody not, you know, just out of favor with God for any reason. The Bible says in Malachi 3, look at verse number 8. Will a man rob God? That's the question. Is someone going to steal from God? I mean, think about the audacity of that. Does someone just have it in their mind? I'm going to rob or steal from the Lord. That's pretty bold. So he poses this question. He says, yet ye have robbed me. He says, you have been robbing me. But you say, where in it? What do you mean we robbed you? We're not, <laughs> Whoa, we're not going into church. We're not going into the temple. We're not like stealing treasures and the gold and stuff. We're not robbing you. But then he explains, he says, in tithes and offerings. He says, that belongs to the Lord. And when you're not doing what's commanded, then you're stealing from God. The tithe belongs to the Lord. And the reason why this comes up every so often is because I don't want you to rob God either. I don't want to rob God. That's why I pay tithes just like everyone else should. Because it's the right thing to do. The Bible says here in verse number 10, but this is, this is the whole point. This is why I even brought this up. Is because a lot of people, they, they, they lack the faith to say, well, I see that this is what's being commanded, but I don't see how I'm going to survive. Because I, I, I don't have that much. So if I give 10%, I mean, I, how am I going to do this? And unfortunately, people make the decision of, of not then giving because they say, well, I, I have to make ends meet and God will understand. But here he's saying, you know, you're robbing God. Amen. And then he says in verse 10, the Bible reads here, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So he's saying, when he says, prove me, it's like, test me. Just test me. Just see if it works. Go ahead and pay the tithe and then, and then just see if God's not capable of just blessing you even further because of your obedience. Just because you decide, you know what, I'll do it. He says, God can open up the windows of heaven and just pour you out a blessing. If he sees you doing the right thing, he'll make sure you get by one way or another. Amen. The Bible says, you know, I have been old, I have been young and now I'm old and I have yet to see the righteous uh, uh, forsaken or a seed begging bread. Amen. God promises that, you know, as a child of God, as a righteous person, you're not going to be begging bread. That's good. When you're living for God, when you're doing what's right, God will take care of you. Now, he doesn't promise to give you all of the luxuries in life. All of the riches, all of the cars, all of the fancy houses or fancy anything. But he promises to provide. Right. Provide your needs. Yeah. And he's saying, if you're worried about your needs being met, just because of the tithe, he says, try it out. Just test it. Just see. You want to test me? You know, when God makes a promise, he says, you'll be taken care of. Yeah. And he says in verse 11, and, and, so in addition to this, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. So when, you know, He's referring to, you know, the land when, when either people oppress them or, you know, insects or whatever that are, that are actually eating up the resources. He says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. So I'll make sure that, that your crops and your food are blessed and producing and not dwindling and going away. And, you know, and then the droughts and the famines and everything else. He says, you follow me, I'll bless you and make sure that those things don't come upon you. So neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, said the Lord of hosts. You won't be losing your crops. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, said the Lord of hosts. But that, that requires faith. 
to, to have that sight of the unseen to trust in God's word and just say, no, this is what I'm going to do. Just like Amaziah needed to trust, hey, I'm just going to part from this hundred talents of silver. It doesn't seem to make any sense to me at all. Because that's a hundred talents of silver. I already paid for them. Why not use what I, you know, what I bought already? And then I'll just trust in the Lord after that. But I've already invested. I might as well get my investment out of it. Nope. Wrong thinking. Have the faith to just understand, well... God's saying this isn't right, so right now I'm just going to cut my losses, whatever it is, and do what's right from here on out. Continuing down the wrong path just because you've been taking that path for a long time is folly. It's foolishness. Learn to cut the tie and just say, I'm done with it now. Confess and forsake the sin. Don't just confess, oh yeah, I'm wrong, and then keep going down that same path. Say, no, confess and forsake it. Get it out. Get it done. This concept reminds me of a, of, a, of a man that I met a long time ago going to church who, you know, he was very well churched. He was a Baptist. He had a family. He started coming to our church. And um, he realized that one of the doctrines he believed in was wrong. And it was the pre-tribulational rapture. So for a long time, he believed this, he taught his family that, you know, and then, and then he finally understood. He says, well, wait, that's wrong. So he changed his mind and converted on that one doctrine to saying this is the truth and this is right. He ended up stopping attending the church because he had a decision to make of acknowledging to his family that they were wrong because if he keeps bringing his family to church, they're going to hear preaching on it. Right, because the church taught that it's a, it's a you know post trib pre wrath rapture, and uh, he decided that he didn't want to cause confusion in his household or mistrust of him as a father. Because if he were to go to his, this is what he was thinking. This was his mindset. Well, if I tell my family that I've been teaching them wrong on this all this time, then I'm worried that they might say, well, what else are you teaching us wrong on? Right? And, and just he has this, this mentality of, well, I might just lose all of their confidence then. The problem is when you hide the truth, what happens when they do find out later? You say, yeah, short-term thinking. You can, you can, okay, I'm going to retain my respect, right? I'm going to retain, in their eyes, they're still going to, you know, I can do no wrong, is ultimately what he wants them to think. But later on, it's going to come out. Right. And then the, the result of that is going to be way worse than if he would have just been honest from the beginning and said, you know what, I am not perfect, I'm not the Lord Jesus Christ. I have been teaching you a certain way. And yeah, I was wrong about this. It doesn't mean I'm wrong about everything. You can still instruct your family. You can still guide your family and say, I can, I can be corrected still. I think that's a great lesson for kids to learn also. I think that's great. When even a parent can have the humility of saying, I was wrong, but this is right. Now, that's not the same as just being tossed about with every wind of doctrine and being a double-minded man and just unstable in all your ways. Obviously, you don't want to be like that. This was a specific situation, a specific case, a specific doctrine that he was convinced, yeah, you know what, I was wrong on this, saw the scripture on it. I mean, the guy was saved, had so many other things right, just this one thing, you know, made the wrong choice. Didn't have the faith to see, look... Be obedient to God. Now, I don't know what ended up happening with that person, but I guarantee you that the result of that decision is not going to play out well or hasn't played out well for him since then. We have points in our life that are just decision-making points. They end up being these crossroads in our life where you kind of have choices to make. Obviously, every day is choices to make, but most of them are, are, are not nearly as, as significant as at other times. I can think of a few times just in my, in my especially pastoring the church, where I've hit some crossroads where I've decided, am I going to preach a certain subject, or what am I going to say about this, or how am I going to handle a certain situation? And these, these are defining moments in your life. 
And I'm just thinking, you know, personally for me as a pastor, but everybody individually has these defining moments in, you know, in your own life. And you need to make sure that you're going to side with God and side with God's word every time. And, and that's what tries your heart. And God's going to look on that. And there are ramifications. There's going to be blessings or cursings that be associated with what you decide to do. And we need to make sure that we don't allow, no matter what the investment has been, down the wrong path to influence our decision of doing right. Uh, turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 19. Another example that comes to mind just for me personally was my recognition of the fact that my music collection and my movie collection was extremely ungodly and was a, a very large detriment to my spiritual growth in life and that I was literally in sin by enjoying and listening to godless music and godless entertainment that didn't just not really have God in it, but was teaching really bad things and was promoting adultery and drugs and violence and everything else that's just wicked and sinful and ungodly. Now, it takes a little while sometimes to come to that decision because your flesh, oftentimes, my flesh really liked that. For me, music was a huge part of my life. For a very, for, from the time I was a child, I loved listening to music. I would have a Walkman with me all the time. I had my boombox, you know. I'm, yeah, I'm a little bit older. I had my cassettes. I had the boombox. I had all that stuff. And I would be playing music nonstop. I loved it. I was really into it. And I was into all kinds of music. And all kinds of wicked music. The rock, the metal, the rap, whatever it was, I listened to all the world's music. And it was garbage. And it was filth. And I, I came to a point where I had to make a decision. Am I just going to just continue in this? Or am I just going to cut it out? And just cut it out completely? And one of the things that I ended up doing with that collection was destroying it. And that gave me a clean break from it, too. Because one of the things, and again, this, is, this ties in with our, with our opening story, with the, you know, the talents of silver. Oftentimes what people want to do when, when they realize something's wrong is they still want to kind of put it in the back closet, put it up on the shelf, so you can still have access to it. Why? Because it costs a lot of money. My music collection cost me a lot of money. My DVD co collection cost me a lot of money. Finding all the rare bootlegs and all these things that you can't find everywhere and getting these recordings and just the box sets and everything else that you could possibly get, that was a big investment. And the fear is, well, I feel real spiritual right now, right? And I know this is wrong and I want to get rid of it. But man, what happens if... In a month, I want to go back and listen to this stuff. Right? I don't think I want to get rid of it. I don't want to listen to it. But what if I want to go back? Look, wrong mindset. When you realize that it's wrong, because I did, it's wrong. Confess it and forsake it and get rid of it. And the way that I chose to get rid of it was to destroy it. And I, I, I didn't even want to just throw it in the trash. I got a chisel and a hammer. And I just started, I took an afternoon. Because it took that long to go through all the CDs, all the tapes, all the DVDs, and just destroy it. And the reason why I destroyed it is when, when you realize, when you come across something that you understand... This isn't just not right for me. This isn't right for anybody. This isn't something that I can just say, well, I don't really want to do this, but it's okay for you. Because if I had that mindset, I might say, well, this cost me a lot of money, so I'll just sell it. 
Because that's the first way you think of, like, well, hey, I can get my money back. But then when you go to sell it, you're going, here, you listen to this filth. You listen to this garbage. You listen to this stuff that's going to spoil your soul and, and, and ruin your spiritual life. I couldn't bring myself to do that. And the reason why I didn't even throw it in the trash is because I said, what if, someone, what if someone sees this whole collection in the trash and takes it out of the trash? That was my mindset. I just, you know, this, is, this is what I was thinking. So I said, you know what? This just needs to be destroyed. So I chose the way I wanted to destroy it. I didn't give it away. I had a roommate that I was living with at the time when I did this. He would have loved to have all that stuff. And he even said, why did you give it to me? Why would you do that? Because I don't want you to have it. As crazy as it may sound, I care about you. So I don't want you to have this stuff. But you just listened to it. I know, I was wrong. I was wrong. But I'm cutting my ties with it now. I'm not going to worry about the hundred talents of silver. And I'm not going to allow that to, to make me keep going down the wrong path just because of that investment. I'm going to count it but done. Count it for loss for the cause of Christ. Acts chapter 19, just so you realize this, we see an example of this in Acts chapter 19 of people starting to get right with God. They get saved and then they come across the stuff that they have, their witchcraft and their sorcery. And you know what they decide to do? They decide to destroy it. Now, people these days get all up in arms and freak out over someone destroying a book, right? Or a book burning or something like that. They go, <gasps> Not a precious book. You can't do that. Now, in general, I'm not for just, just mass book burning of like everything that's ever been written. Say, well, this isn't the Bible, so burn it. Okay, so now what I'm saying. But there's definitely some wicked things that just need to be destroyed and need to just be stamped out. And I think, it, yes, it's absolutely right and fine. And God's not going to care. In fact, God's probably going to enjoy that you're destroying some wicked, either filth or things that are going to draw people to like another god or whatever. Yeah, yeah just get rid of it. Destroy it. That's right. when, when the children of Israel were, were stamping out the nations that were there before them, God said, don't learn their ways. I don't want you to know anything about them. I don't want your heart being drawn away from the true God. That's, right. That's what he taught. That's what the Bible teaches. Yeah. And what we see here is people getting right with God in Acts chapter 19. Let's see what they do. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. God's word prevailed over this filth, over this sorcery, over this witchcraft. Because that's what the curious arts are. This is like occult books, this uh, um, you know, sorcery, witchcraft type books. These people in this chapter, they were given over to that stuff. And they had these big collections of these books. And they said, you know what? The Lord is God. I believe in God. This stuff is, is horrible. It's wicked. We're getting rid of it. And they just happen to, you know, like, as we're getting rid of this stuff, they're like, man, how much is all this stuff worth? And they count up at 50,000 pieces. Of That's a lot of money. That is a big revival. That is people getting right with God. And this is a story that's praised in Scripture. As something, yeah, that's good to do. You don't, you know, when it, when it comes to, you know, retaining history or whatever, whatever people want to give on these books... Look, if some if some pervert and, and some Satanist writes a book, I have no interest in preserving his thoughts at all. I'm fine with stamping that out. People in the witchcraft and the occult that write these books, you know, the, the, the satanic Bible, let's just burn them. And you're like, I, I have no problem with that. There's plenty of other examples that you can apply this to in your life. Just think about areas where you know you've been wrong on, but maybe you've made a big investment. Right. You know, clothing standards come to mind, because that's another big one. Right. 
way in the early days of, of you know our marriage, when my wife was newly, she was only saved for about a year before we got married. So she's a younger Christian, and you know we got married, and I was like, okay, well here's the deal, you know in our household, um, you know the that her clothing was going to change a little bit. I mean she was wearing dresses and skirts a little bit already, but I just I just said no, this is the way things are going to be, and I said you're not going to wear pants and you're not going to wear these things. So. That was, that was another issue. So, well, I already have this stuff. Well, I spent a lot of money on this. Right. Right? You're working a corporate job, and I had to spend all this money to get these, you know, these clothing. And I said, well, it's, it's either right or it's wrong. Right. And if it's wrong, it doesn't matter how much money you spent on it. Right. Right. And she said, okay, well, you're going to have to buy me a new wardrobe. I said, okay, <laughs> you're right, I do. <laughs> because if we're getting rid of clothes, then they need to be replaced. So, right. amen, I'll do that. That's fine, I'll be happy to do that. But... Um, you know, just it, whatever the thing may be, or you, you just, just apply it in your life. Think about what it is that you've seen from Scripture. You've seen, wow, I've been doing things wrong here for a long time. Don't let the cost sway you from doing the right thing. Just, just, just cut it loose. Be done with it. That was one of the best things I did when I got rid of my music collection because that had such a power and control in my life. And it still has influence. You just can't ever seem to get away from it. You hear it when you go out to restaurants. You hear it at the gas station. You hear that stuff everywhere. And because I allowed so much into my life, now I still hear those things. And sometimes my flesh still just wants to listen to it. And it's a battle. It's a struggle. But, but doing that clean cut and just saying, nope, I'm going to get rid of this. I'm not going to count the cost on that. It is a big benefit to your spiritual strength right. to be able to just keep, make you stronger and be able to resist. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 is the last place I'll have you turn this morning. One, one final um, application to this concept. You say, well, what about my college degree, especially for the ladies, that the moms, the wives, right? You see in the scripture talking about women having a meek and quiet spirit in First Peter and saying that that is of great value, that is precious in God's eyes. And you see these attributes in Proverbs 31 and the, and the, and the woman who's, who's got a, 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 a virtuous spirit and, is, and the attributes that are pro, uh, promoted in the Bible by the Lord. You say, well, what about all this stuff? I mean, well, first of all, we're still paying off student loans for my wife. <laughs> There's a cost there. Say, so, yeah, but I mean, all that investment, she's got this degree, why should she go off and get a job and you get more money? Because it's not all about the money. That's right. Because right. it's not about the money. Amen. Our life isn't about the money. That's a, yeah, money is necessary to live, but that's not what we live for. Right. Amen. I'd much rather have very little money and be right with God than have a lot of money and not be right with God. Yeah. And sometimes the decisions seem hard, but they're really not that hard. It's a simple decision to make. It's not complicated. But it feels difficult because you've been invested a certain way. Yeah. Oh, man. Right. It's hard to say, you mean to tell me I spent all this time and work and energy and money doing all of this, and now I just have to let it go? Right. Well, let's look at what the Apostle Paul did yeah. in Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul was a pedigreed Pharisee. He was a Jew that he had everything lined up. He was taught. He was, you know, he went through the ranks and he worked real hard to become this, you know, to become a respected Pharisee, which is what he was trying to do. He was trying to climb the ranks in his Pharisee religion. Yeah. And he was attaining all of these different, you know, you call them, I call them rewards or just his, uh, his uh, accolades within the Pharisee religion. But when he got saved, he decided, 
I don't want anything to do with this stuff. It, it means nothing to me. Look at verse number 1 here in Philippians chapter 3. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. He's starting off this chapter by just pointing out that what really matters is that you know, we're worshiping God in spirit, not in the flesh. Because the Jews' religion is all about the carnality. It's all about the physical, the, circum the physical circumcision, the physical genealogy, the physical everything. That's what they cared about. And he's saying, you know, we're the true worshipers of God. We worship God in spirit. It's about the spirit. We rejoice in Jesus Christ. We have no confidence in our flesh. We know that it's not about us and how well we keep the law and how good we are in any of those things. Verse number four, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. He's saying, oh, you think that you're able to trust in your flesh and, and all of those physical things? He says, I have more reason to, to have that mindset than you do. So compare yourself to me. And now he goes into, you know, who he is or who he was. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day. So right from birth, his parents did what was right. He was circumcised on the eighth day, just like Moses' law says he needed to be. Yeah. Of the stock of Israel. So he is, you look back at his genealogy. He is of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews. His line's not tainted. He was circumcised the eighth day. As touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal. He said, oh, you want to talk about zeal? So I was a Pharisee. You want to talk about zeal, though? I went and I persecuted the church. All these Christians with their blasphemy. I was going out. Not only was I against them, I went and sought them out. I was zealous to serve as a Pharisee. He says, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now, obviously, he knows he wasn't perfect. But basically, what he's saying is to compare yourself to me. You know, I was keeping the law and, and, you know, and of course, he was trusting in that until he got saved. And he's saying, compare yourself to me. Go ahead. And then he says in verse 7, But what things were gained to me? How was it gained? It was gain in the Pharisee religion. Yeah. It was gain in the eyes of the Jews. That is what people would respect him for. The Jews respected him for that as a Pharisee. Wow, man, look at this guy. All this respect for Paul. Right. Check his genealogy. He was circumcised. Check him out. Look at his zeal. Look at him go. He says, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yeah, he could have gained more and more continuing on that path in a worldly sense. Getting accolades, getting lifted up by men. Receiving all the greetings in the marketplace. Getting the chief seats at the feasts. He could have had all that. He says, those things that, that were gained... Those were loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. He's saying, I count all of that stuff as dung. But Paul, you worked so hard for that. I mean, in order to say you're blameless, you worked really hard at that. You studied as a Pharisee. You were brought up under, you know, these other Pharisees. And you, you studied, you learned, you went out, you dedicated your time, persecuting, you did all this stuff. Dung. Dung. Why? For the cause of Christ. He says, in, in, in regards to what really matters in this life, it's dung. But you worked so hard to get your business degree and study and do this... That's not what God wants me to do. It's done. Verse number 9. And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And it goes on and on. Apostle Paul is willing to give up and count 
his own, you know, his, his works, everything as a Pharisee, kind of done. All of his education doesn't matter. He doesn't need that because it wasn't right. We need to be able to recognize the areas we're wrong and whatever the investment is. But I've learned to become this bartender. I went to bartender school and I could make all these drinks and I could do this so great and I can make a lot of money at this and I've invested in this. You're giving people poison. Alcohol is going to destroy people's lives. The right thing is to not do it at all. The ends don't justify the means. When something's not right, hey, just chalk it up to lesson learned. Stupidity. Done. Done with it. Move on. Move on to what's right. Don't let the cost, that value, have any impact on you doing the right thing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for uh, the... Your words, for the words of instruction and um, for the, the clearness of the instruction. Lord, I pray that you would please just help us with these simple concepts to just put them in place in our life. Uh, it's really just a struggle of our flesh against the spirit. God, help to strengthen our spirit. Help us to, to make sound decisions that, are, that line up with what you would have us to do and, and to not get caught up in money or finances or our time investment in things that weren't right. Lord, help us to be able to just cut them out and and move forward and move forward to serve you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.